my peoples, what's up? Welcome to Shelf Stories, the channel that tells tales from games, books, and life. I am your host, Jason. Thank you so much for stopping by for this latest episode of Shelf Help, the series where I give tips and tricks on how to become a happier gamer and a happier person. I'm coming at you live today from my psychotherapy office. Uh, having just watched uh, some stuff, uh, I'm between clients over here, so why not fire up the YouTubes, uh, see what's going on, and... Over the last couple of days, I have really enjoyed the conversation based on my video called Prices. The prices are too darn high. Uh, released it a couple days ago as I'm filming this episode, and this one will go up a, a little while after. And so much good stuff. Uh, people who agreed and felt that I was giving voice to something that people kind of wanted to say, but it wasn't coming out. It was coming out kind of stilted, but then it's like, okay, finally, someone just said it. The prices are too darn high. And I really appreciated that feedback uh, and people sharing their journeys of, you know, kind of going through some of the psychological temptations that I discussed, like FOMO and different things in the last episode. So that was awesome. Uh, also, plenty of folks who disagree. Uh, and a lot of, uh, a number of folks who are like, Jason, I usually agree with you, but this one, eh. <laughs> Uh, and some really good, artic well articulated um, stuff in good faith. In particular, uh, Alex uh, Radcliffe from Board Game Co. did a whole video. Thank you so much for watching my own video, giving me the shout out, responding. And so this would be, I guess, a response to the response. Uh, but this isn't a debate at all. This is just a discussion amongst uh, people who generally agree, but there's some stuff, uh, cleavages that you know could be addressed. Uh, some other folks, uh, my brother, uh, Jeremy Howard from Drama Lab Plays Games, Man vs. Meeple, had a great comment on my on the Facebook that made me think. Um, comments, I <laughs> love the comments uh, it, at Shelf Stories. Uh, people who are engaging, Chris Lay had a good comment. Uh, G Club had a really long uh, discussion, very respectful and, you know, articulating some of his concerns. And I, I, could, I could go on, you know, and name more, but, you know, just... I'm shouting everybody out, you know, just all of you, you know who you are. So I wanted to do this follow-up to address, uh, I think, a particular line of argument uh, that came through on, on one way or another in most of the people who were giving me feedback. And this is the point about personal responsibility. And I think that some folks took my video as me trying to resolve you know, folks of personal responsibility or, you know, taking it to a more of an extreme saying that like, oh, what do you don't like deluxe? And, you know, do you want to get rid of all deluxe? And just everybody has the same things over and over again. And people had a big problem with that, or that implication. And that's not something I said in the video, um, but I can see where people kind of connect the dots. I know how people connect dots. Had a whole video on that one too. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to clarify and, and drill down and say on no certain terms, that I absolutely agree that personal responsibility is a huge part of any discussion about price because it's about what people are paying, you know? And if the prices are too darn high, if people are feeling that way, at the end of the day, it is up to folks, uh, real talk, it's up to, you know, people to be responsible with their money. Um, Alex had made that point very clear. And what, look at his comments. I really recommend checking out that video, express the comments because there's a lot of folks that are jumping in saying, yeah, you know, um, I've tried to be responsible this way and this way. A lot of people giving constructive, um, you know, tips and tricks and sharing their experiences. Go ahead and check that out. I don't have a problem with any of that. You know, absolutely. Well, <laughs> that is a huge part of the conversation. I guess what I'm saying in the my first video, and I'll say it here more clearly, is that I think that is half of the conversation. I think the other half belongs to the uh, critique, you know, of this stuff and maybe on even on the publisher side or on the side of, you know, people who enjoy the deluxe gamers. Like, what's that hobby? What is that practice of deluxe and all in actually doing? And that's two sided. You know, that is the publisher feeding the wants and needs and, you know, ex expressed uh, market power of the people who have money. And. I was reminded, I was really reflecting on this, I was reminded of my own experience living in Brooklyn, New York. I'm Brooklyn, New York, born and bred, USA. And, you know, just over the last however long it's been, 10, 15 years, the prices just went, 
skyrocketed. You know, people just wanted to be in New York and they had market power and they're paying all the stuff for, paying money for houses and businesses. And, you know, the, the price of things went up and but all of a sudden nicer boutiques where it was, you know, like a, like a dinky mom and pop shop. All of a sudden I'm seeing some boutique artisan something. <laughs> You know, I get something from the Polish butcher and now I'm getting it from an artisan cheesery or something like that. Uh, just it, this stuff happens, you know, in that area. We call it gentrifying, you know, and in some way I was articulating a form of critique that could be kind of summarized as a, maybe in some ways board games are gentrifying. People with money, people who are comfortable paying $600 for all in. Uh, people who are comfortable paying $80 for a deluxified, you know, small game uh, are driving the market. The market, I don't think, is a real thing. I think it's a, the voice of well-off people. It's demanding things and it's, and it's also, you know, a companies that are satisfying that demand that leaves out or leaves behind a whole class of people who used to feel at home. Right. And that's really what it is. You know, it's not like people that are griping and whining. I think people are uh, some folks who are like, oh, you're just whining because you can't afford everything. You, why are you whining? Why are you jelly? All that kind of thing. I got a lot of comments on those ends. It's not quite that. I mean, whatever. I mean, it's that I think there was more and more people that used to feel like they were able to afford this hobby that they can't quite afford as much nice crap anymore. Uh, or they're new to the hobby because the hobby is growing or their friend got them into it. And, you know, they come, they come in, they dive in the hole. And all of a sudden it's like, what? How much did I spend? And how much do I have to, how much do I have to spend to feel like I am not just enjoying games, but feel like I'm a part of conversations. And that's really what it is. Like when it comes to the FOMO and the social aspect, it's playing games is that's like a, a fiction. You know, we only enjoy games in community. And if the online communities, uh, and Alex made this video, this point very good, so thank you very much for giving me that, um, about the online communities, you know, if a bunch of us are playing the nicest games, then we're going to feel like we want to play the nicest games too, and that the rationality about whether I can afford it kind of trails behind, unfortunately. By the time we realize what we've done, purchases, backed projects, and just all that stuff happens. So um, I'm pointing that out. I'm pointing out that the board game hobby is basically doing the equivalent of gentrifying in some ways. Um, and I wanted to point out that that leaves people behind and people are val have valid feelings about it, articulated by my, the title of my last video. That was the intention. Not My intention was not to take anybody's deluxe away. <laughs> Believe me. So, okay, in fairness, the gentrification argument isn't perfect. There's still plenty of cheap product. Go to Target, go to a local game store. Plenty of very, very affordable games if you want to afford uh, gaming. So let me um, so let me kind of you know address three different streams with that, uh, with what I mean by the prices are too darn high. Uh, I would like to address companies first. And I'm not letting them off the hook. <laughs> I think a lot of folks, like when you, when you go the personal responsibility route, you know, it's basically the hidden thing is, okay, well, companies are going to company, you know, they have to make margins. They have to do this. Just let them do their thing. Personal responsibility. Let's talk about you as the consumer. And I'm not willing to do that. I'm just not, you know, I, I got a comment that I, uh, I'm articulating a populist critique. I own that with all, every fiber of my being. I made me so happy to read that comment. Yes, I'm a populist. Talk for the peoples. Uh, and not that companies should just, you know, never do deluxe. But when you reach into the honeypot, when you reach into that market, especially on Kickstarter, that is willing to buy deluxe, uh, and, you know, you're making that increased margin off of it, it, you know, there is a cost to that that is more than just the actual bottom line, the, the, the numbers, right? It does, inc it does add to the sense of like kind of rising prices that I think is having a negative cynical, cynicism generating effect amongst people in the community. When it becomes about numbers, then there's no surprise when somebody says it's all about numbers because it is. <laughs> they say, somebody might say it in a cynical way, but that if we just follow the honey trail and deluxify and do whatever, I mean, I, that's what's going to happen. It's just exhaust. Like you, you fire up the engine of hype, you get the exhaust of cynicism and companies, they're not innocent to that. 
you know, uh, because of the lore of deluxification. So I guess it's an invitation to companies to, cons if you can, I don't know if you can, I'm going to try to get some people on to help me understand the economics a little bit more. Uh, but you know, if it, if it makes sense, um, you know, try to release more product for uh, masses. Some companies already do. A lot of people, you know, said like, oh, check this out, Robinsberger and um, what was it? Uh, Cosmos and a few other companies that they, uh, Funko, uh, the, the Prospero Hall games, like they dedicated to making the, the cheaper product. Great. You know, and even if you're making more, uh, you know, boutique product, anytime you can, you know, try to get that price down for people, man, you know, that would be really helpful. That, that, that's an invitation. You know, it isn't like a directive. I'm not telling, not shaming anybody into doing anything. It's just an invitation to reflect that there is, there may be more to your business than just the bottom line cost. To people directly who can afford deluxe, who can afford the minis and, you know, especially folks who are backing multiples of these things. You know, I mean, I'm privileged enough. I can back a couple of, the, of projects here and there. I'm a, I'm a back of, 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 of Radia, uh, the past week there. I tried to be waiting for that project for four years. Shocked at the price, but yes, I, I really wanted. I just kind of made it work in my budget. Um, you know, so I'm I'm not I'm that I'm there too, <laughs> with the painted minis and the changeable heads and whatever else is going on over there. Uh, you know, I don't want to take that away from people. I enjoy that too. I think like, but I had to really arrange things. I, you know, I, this is I, no games for like months because I knew this was coming. That type of you know budgeting. Uh, there is uh, people who are on the upper level beyond that who can afford multiple of these, you know, all in type projects. I'm not going to say, sit here and say that that's bad or immoral or whatever. What I do want to focus on is that that has a consequence. It's, I think we have such, we've gotten so used to saying, well, that's their money. They can do what they want. And we're not as much looking at it from an ecosystem perspective. Like you can't separate these things that when you know, what, what every single, like, you know, kind of successfully all-in pledge project encourages the next successfully all-in project, all-in project deluxe. Like, there's, it's contributing to that quote-unquote gentrifying aspect. Prices will rise when, with each project that successfully funds and it just blows out and breaks records, that will raise prices. It is not just because of the manufacturing stuff. <laughs> and so, do you care? It's like, well, if you don't care, you don't care. But to point out that that is a consequence, and to point out that you're rising prices in that way, or just like feeding consumer demand, consumer obsession that way, has a consequence that I think, keep, that I think bears talking about. That's where I am. No canceling, no shaming, an invitation to reflect that it isn't just about I can do what I want. This stuff has downstream consequences and they land on, well, not land on, but uh, people like me can observe because I'm tuned to the psychology of these things and how marketing and everything kind of impacts us. So an invitation, not deluxe, <laughs> deluxe all you want, um, but just an invitation to consider consequences, okay? Now I wanna get to the shelf help piece. So in terms of the people who feel the pull, maybe, you know, the budget isn't there for that. Uh, maybe, you know, or maybe you're new to the hobby or you're in the hobby and you're used to a certain standard and now the standard's kind of gotten way out of control, uh, way out beyond what you can afford in terms of how much you buy and how much you play. Uh, or you're just kind of in that middle spot, right? Um, or, you know, you want, you aspire to that, that a spot where you can engage in the hobby the way you want and you can't quite make it work in terms of the numbers. Alex put his video in a, in the context of if you can't afford it, don't buy it. And that be, that becomes a lot of the comments. If you can't afford it, don't buy it. Personal responsibility. It be, that becomes a shaming thing. You know, people accuse me of shaming, but then that, I feel like that becomes a shaming thing uh, of like, you know, if you can't afford it, don't buy it. You know, don't be jelly. That it, Yes that's not my way of saying that. Uh, it's 
actually from a psychotherapist perspective, uh, because I'm, I do behavior and help people get behavior change, that's actually uh, a very poor way to frame it. People don't respond to that. Uh, don't do a thing, right? How, how do people respond to like, don't smoke? How do people respond to don't curse if you're trying to like clean up your language and everything? You know, if you put it in that negative way, you know, don't buy games you can't afford. Um, in my line of work, my line of therapy, which is called cognitive behavioral therapy, we like to say, never give people advice that a dead person can do better. A dead person can stop smoking better than you. A dead person can balance their budget better than you. Budget zero. <laughs> so you will not be a dead person at that. So don't give that advice. Try to find a different way to frame it. And I like to offer that for the people who are into the personal responsibility end. What I'll say is, is the title of this video, it is buy because you want to. Try not to buy because you feel like you have to. In psychotherapy, in you know the work that I do, in anxiety and depression and everything, the distinction between doing things because you want to and doing things because you think you have to is so critical. Doing things because you want to, happiness. Do it things because you feel like you have to, stress, anxiety, all the bad things, right? And that's weird to say, this luxury hobby and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, that you never have to buy anything. And it's not an external force. It's just the reality of our feelings, you know? Like, why do we, quote unquote, have to buy uh, play a game or buy a game? Because they're playing it. And I want to be a part of that group. Uh, why do I have to buy this? Because uh, I want to be uh, in this conversation. I, you know, I'm having an agita about, like, I'm seeing this ad flash me every time I open up the browser. And, you know, we can say I can't afford it with our conscious brains. But back here in our, our fear, emotional brains, it's, it's playing, it's playing, it's playing. It's causing distress, distress. Oh, I want it, I want it, I want it. And you're doing it because to get some sort of relief or soothing, and not actually because of happiness and like delight, the, the, the more positive emotions. So, you know, and I have my critiques that people that, you know, the marketing stokes that. Stokes because that people buy more <laughs> when they're FOMO'd. Like they make the short term, you know, uh, play even if it's long term not good for you. So marketing will do that. That's the fact of science of marketing, getting stoking that stuff up so that they can buy. As a consumer... I want to give people a real, uh, good, positively stated way to kind of deal with it. A way that helps people check with their feelings. If you find yourself going down the rabbit hole, if you find yourself, you know, looking at the Flamecraft project, I, I, I talked about Flamecraft. Again, not, um, I don't want to pick on that project. I don't want to pick on that company. I don't know the project. I don't know the company. It just it stood out because they're right there next to each other. And the deluxe version was funded so much bigger. 9,000 backers to, to about 500. You know, if you're looking at that type of pledge where the deluxe and the, the bottom are, you know, you know, the deluxe and the regular version are together. And you're saying to yourself, you know, which one should I buy? And the answers to the deluxe version are, well, I don't want to miss out on it. And I don't, I, I don't want to feel like I'm getting the worst version. You know, that is not as positive an emotion. You check in on your feelings and you say, do I really want this? Or do I feel like I kind of have to have it because of whatever feelings? And I'm just soothing feelings. You know, I really hope that this video encourages folks who are looking at those pledges together. Because Kickstarter encourages, incentivizes putting those things right together, the all in and the regular, the deluxe and the regular, da, 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 da. Uh, Descent and the version of Descent, it's a version of Descent that used to be <laughs> way more affordable, never like a, a game for the masses, but more affordable. And now it is this deluxe, big deluxe thing. Am I buying it because I want to? Or am I buying it to soothe feelings? And therefore, because I feel like I have to. Just as a quick little thing to carry with you. Very easy to remember. Way to check your feelings and positive and a way to answer the personal responsibility folks, which I completely agree with you. But I also invite those folks to engage in the other side of the conversation as well, which is we are responsible for each other. 
we they, they were in an ecosystem and our choices affect everybody. You know, uh, offering this stuff will raise prices. People buying this stuff will raise prices. Raising prices will cause agita, will cause that gentrification feeling. Ba 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 ba. So, hope that's clear. Uh, <laughs> and uh, looks like I am right on time. Looks like it's about two forty-five. My uh, next client is coming in, so I'm gonna sign off. Uh, this is Jason reminding you: if you can change your mind, you can change the world. So, till next time, wait, everybody.